Welcome, Nancy. It's a genuine pleasure, as always, to be with you and to welcome you to our How Conversation. Nancy is currently the director of the Shorenstein Center and the visiting Edward R. Murrow Professor of Practice of Press, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard, formerly the editor of Time Magazine, and also now a fellow board member of the Howe Institute for Society. Welcome, Nancy. Great to be with you. Likewise. Nice to see you, sort of, virtually. Sort of. How, how are you? How have you fared first in the lockdown and then in this new phase, this gray area where we're all trying to navigate uh, the gray and encounter challenges that we didn't think we would have to? Like every other major event, I, I think about it first as a journalist, how would I tell this story? The idea that we could come into what we thought of as an election year. And when I was you know, teaching in January and we're all watching the Iowa caucuses and preparing for the New Hampshire primary, and this year, the story of 2020 was going to be a, a reckoning with, a, with a, a very unusual presidency. To have that be pushed aside what was surely going to be an enormous story pushed aside by a pandemic, an economic collapse, an explosion of social unrest, all crowding each other for our attention. It truly is like, like nothing I have ever lived through. I think most of us have ever lived through where you have, to, in each case, you have to go back 50 years to like the 1968, 1970 period for a corollary on social unrest. You have to go back a hundred years for an, an analog to the pandemic. You have to go back to the depression for an analog to this level of unemployment and economic distress. It, it's like our sensors just aren't uh, calibrated to take in this much news. And so I think this is a tremendous challenge to all of us as individuals, as members of community, as employees, as members of families. Um, and I, I find that just both fascinating from the point of view of a, a student of history and, and quite exhausting as a storyteller. And, it, and are you saying that this is like nothing we've ever seen or lived with because of all the different dynamics and crises that are combusting and simultaneously happening, is that's what you think is really different? Yes, I think any one of these would be the kind of story that defines a generation. Okay. And instead, we have three or four or five stories of that scale, of that level of impact. You know, th there's really nothing in almost any of our lifetimes um, that has affected every human being on Earth the way this pandemic. We don't live experiences together in that way. You can talk about how you know, globalization and the new economy and technology affects everyone and half the world is on Facebook. That is not the same as you know, large parts of the world simultaneously not being able to leave their house because they could get sick. That is certainly unlike anything we've seen. And then the other, you know, the other enormous events that we are witnessing are obviously you know, closely connected to that. So, you know, everything in a way comes back to the pandemic. And as you, as you said, it, it accelerates, it amplifies, it, it dislodges from our attention uh, everything that we took for granted. Does it forever change us? And, and have you started to get a sense of the way that, have you been, do you feel changed? Or do you feel like you'll emerge changed? Won't that be the most fascinating thing for us to see, not just about ourselves, but about our children, about our workplaces. Some of these things, certainly, I, I hope, represent permanent change. You know, I'll speak now as, at the moment, a professor. While I, I value enormously being in the classroom with my students, we know that that is a luxury experience that the majority of people who would love access to a college or, or graduate education can't afford. And the fact that we are all now having to really reinvent the way we teach in order to be able to do it virtually opens up such tremendous opportunity for people all around the world, all ages, at all stages of their life. And while I think that there will be tremendous victims of this, and I think that there will be, you know, historic institutions of secondary and higher education that don't survive this. I think the flip side of that tremendous disruption is opening up pathways of education to people who, who would not have had a chance 
much, much sooner than would have happened otherwise. It seems like there's going to be a BC uh, and a AC before Corona and after Corona, and that will indelibly be changed. Our expectations of institutions that you refer to will be changed. And by segue, I think our expectations of leaders will be changed. I mean, you've talked about us being in a cascade of crises. Do you think we're in a leadership crisis? Are, are people getting from those in charge what they need from those in charge? Well, we know we're in a leadership crisis. Every single indicator suggests that. Um, but that was true before the, before the virus hit. And you know, we knew that we were in a crisis of authority where ideas about expertise and shared, you know, shared facts and a shared reality, all of that had been put up for grabs before this year. I think any of us can point in any number of directions to see failed, failed leadership. And, but I put it broadly into two categories. There, there are failures of leadership that basically reflect the fact that this is really hard. That when you are facing a, a challenge that is unprecedented, that was, um, even to the extent that it was foreseeable, we were out of position to meet it, and people are having to make calculations quickly, people are going to make mistakes. There are going to be missed opportunities. There, I mean, the greatest leaders make mistakes. And so there are the ones that sort of, I think that the failures of leadership that come embedded in the challenge as just being the nature, if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be a challenge, right? But then there are the fail failures of leadership that I put much more in the category of moral leadership, where decisions that were made were driven more by a set of priorities that were not worthy of being given primacy mm -hmm. and that distorted the decisions that prevented progress from being made of, of values that got in the way of leaders doing what was right for the greater good at the time. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of leadership that has been excruciating for us to watch because it is literally coming at the cost of lives lost. When you think about the fact in this country that did not have, unlike many societies around the world, we did not have a culture of wearing masks. The fact that you could have a public health behavior taken up incredibly quickly by anywhere, depending on if you believe the reporting, the self-reporting, anywhere between 50, 60, 80 percent of people this quickly, on the one hand, was a remarkable thing. On the other hand, the fact that for opportunistic and, and self-serving reasons, this became a politicized, dividing, uh, litmus test of what tribe you were in, rather than an opportunity to call people to protect one another. I mean, the mask is a, is a beautiful, wonderful, terrifying metaphor for the whole crisis, where, you know, what are we giving, what are we prepared to give up? In this case, our, our, very, our very faces, our smiles, our, our, you know, access to what is in front of us in a literal sense in order to protect other people. So Nancy, we're actually going to play a clip uh, of something you said about moral leadership being a survival skill in the gathering we had uh, just recently. Right now, being confident about what's going to happen would sound clueless. And being willing to embrace that kind of uncertainty and that need for uh, listening to as many different people and being open to as many different views feels you know, profoundly like part of a survival skill and not just a worthy thing to do. Tell, what do you mean by a survival skill? Uh, and then how do you hone moral leadership as a survival skill? I don't see any chance of success on the horizon uh, that we can reach without moral leaders. It's not that we don't need other gifts in our leaders as well, but the particular qualities of moral leadership seem to me the ones that have the best chance of getting us through this passage. And I, and I say that making a distinction between other qualities of leadership that we associated instinctively with strong leaders, the leader on horseback charging in front of the troops into battle, you know, waving his sword and, and uh, that others would follow his, his often typically historically his lead. Uh, the qualities I'm talking about are at odds with that 
image, the statuary image of the great leader. It, they're qualities like humility and uh, knowing what you don't know, which opens up all sorts of room for creativity and agility to adapt to changing circumstances. I mean, this takes us, fascinating, takes us back to the mask question. Remember that part of the problem with masks was that initially we had experts, we had the World Health Organization right. telling people that you didn't need to wear a mask. Partly that was because of what they didn't know about asymptomatic spread, but partly it was an attempted exercise of moral leadership because they were worried about people going out and buying masks who didn't need them and therefore them not being available to healthcare workers, which ended up having very negative consequences downstream. So it isn't that moral leaders are perfect leaders. It isn't that they get everything right. It's what do you do when you get something wrong? How open are you to being told that you're getting something wrong? Who's allowed to tell you that? Only someone who is your peer or someone who is way below you in the hierarchy. And, and if we open up those kinds of circuits of communication and accountability, where even people who hold much less traditional power, who don't count as leaders in our, in our frameworks, still are empowered to hold us accountable, to say, I don't think you're right about that, to challenge thinking. It doesn't mean that everything gets done by consensus, but I do think it increases the odds that the leaders will hear and have access to perspectives and information that they need to make the best decisions. And it takes a willingness to set aside pride, set aside egos, set aside a certain amount of, of self-confidence. You know, you need confidence to be a leader and yet, and make hard decisions. Yeah. And yet you also have to be willing to set that aside enough to hold open the possibility that you're wrong about any given thing. That's a very tricky balancing act. And I think that's what I'm getting at, that when we are in such uncertain territory as we are now, it's going to take that kind of nimbleness and that kind of openness uh, to leading from beside. Mm -hmm who's next to you and what are they thinking and looking at who's behind you and what are they thinking and being willing to and able to take all of that in even as you're trying to be the one who's moving everyone forward and listening to you I, I, what i'm picking up is that the commitment to truth and truth telling even truth telling about mistakes and having been wrong has to be so deep and fierce that it transcends all you're just truth is setting everybody free and are you saying something? It, it see, I mean, you spent so much time as a journalist in the business of being truthful and owning up and being accountable when you get things wrong. Tell, tell us more about how can you share truth with people, and especially in such a divided society uh, that is struggling to share truth? I tend to put the greatest faith in people whose expression of truth still allows room for mystery. That that if someone is willing to tell me both what they know and what they don't know, and there's research that supports this, that, you know, that, that people are inclined to trust, they trust hard truths. They would rather hear a hard truth than the happy talk that's meant to make them feel better. And, and it tends to increase credibility if you admit where the limits of your knowledge are. So if you even look at someone like Anthony Fauci, who has been, you know, of all the leaders within this uh, extraordinary season, the one whose challenges I think we have been watching with both great respect, great sympathy. <laughs> you know, he's, he's trying to deal at age 79 or whatever he is yeah. with uh, an almost impossible circumstances while his family is getting death threats because there are people who do not like what he is saying. Mm -hmm. They do not like the truth that he is telling. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, you know, at this point, I feel like the, the, you get a sense of when people are giving you, you know, what Bob Woodward used, they used to call the, you know, the best possible attainable version of the truth. It isn't that anyone is going to get everything absolutely right, especially when we are in a place where we have never been. But that's where I think, I think the speaking the truth is extraordinarily important but within that has to be, this goes back to humility, the acknowledgement of the mystery that abides with whatever mm -hmm. it is that you are trying to do. 
What are some of the things that moral leaders do and can do well to create more trust so that we can be who we need to be? I think the, the restoration of trust, whether it is institutional trust or individual trust, uh, may be the very highest priority for us as a country, as citizens, as individuals. And, and in fact, you know, the American people say when you ask them about they're they're conscious of this decline in trust that's been that goes back 40 years. It's not a immediate, you know, result of Twitter or Donald Trump or any other thing that arrived on scene in the in you know recent years. It's trust decline goes back to the late 1960s, early 1970s. And it's been pretty steady. I don't think it is a coincidence that it was the, the high point of accountability journalism with Watergate that really brought home to the next generation of journalists that the job of the journalist was to hold powerful people accountable, to shine a light in dark places, to expose malfeasance, incompetence, corruption. And that is a you know, worthy and important role for the watchdogs of the fourth estate. The problem with that is that to the extent that that is your focus, then people are going to be ingesting a steady diet of institutional failure, corruption, incompetence, and they are going to read much more about what is not working, which we have mm -hmm. it as our job to illuminate, than what is working. And it would be quite understandable to come away with the impression <laughs> that mm -hmm. our leaders are all venal, they're all out for themselves. You know, for a journalist to write a positive profile of either a CEO or an innovative governor of a state uh, walks into the buzzsaw of, of criticism from their colleagues about writing a puff piece. Like it is, it is almost positive journalism instantly delegitimized. So there's been a whole movement of solutions journalism and people trying to correct this, of saying it is, it is important that we tell the stories about what is working and solutions that can be scaled and mm. leaders who should be who should be yeah. emulated uh as well as the mission of what isn't working but i don't feel like we've gotten that balance right and it's going to be hard to do it right around now here we are in august you wrote in the washington post just recently uh, the pandemic infects our lives and politics with false choices save lives or livelihoods, defend freedom or wear a mask, protect the old or teach the young. What is it worth to see classrooms open and how can parents possibly do that calculation? And you know, for a lot of my, my professional life, I wrote about the presidency and I tried to cover presidents as people rather than occupants of an office yeah. because that was the interesting part of it to me, that they are still, human with foods they don't like and sleepless nights and things they're scared of and like the rest of us except they also hold a job that puts them at you know in a position to affect the lives of billions of people around the world and the thing about being a being a president is that you only make hard decisions all the easy ones get made further down the food chain. Any, any decision that makes it to a normal president's desk, by definition, is a hard decision, which means there's a good argument for going either way, which means that, that the daily need of anyone in a position of power, that one or any other, is for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. the, the nature of a hard decision is there was a good case for going the other way. And you have to, you have to be able to forgive yourself for the price that you pay, whichever way you choose. And so now devolve that kind of tension, that kind of pressure onto every mom and dad trying to decide whether to send their third grader to class or not. And the, the potential physical and mental and emotional and social cost if they don't uh, versus the Right. potential enormous cost not just to them and their family but to their community if they are part of reigniting community spread in their community if they do um there's there is no right answer to this right. and i and every parent i talk to and again they're 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 a metaphor for decisions that business leaders right. are making about 
how to handle their workers, how to handle their, uh, you know, if they are a customer facing business, how do you do that safely? The, the leaders of universities whose very survival may depend on having students come back in person, but what if that is not actually mm -hmm. safe? I mean, these, these are really, really difficult decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think one thing we have to understand is that once you make it, you still live with the alternative. And you still are going to have to mm -hmm. figure out a way to forgive yourself for the choice that you did not make, whatever mm -hmm. the outcome ends up being. Because very seldom do these decisions yield a clear, oh, you made the right decision. Describe a framework for making these decisions. What's the moral calculus? What what framework should moral leaders use when they're staring in the face of a, a dilemma uh, where either side comes with real cost? I don't think any moral leader or any leader of any kind is going to be successful if they can't first, first bridge the divide. And we all know how divided we are along so many different right. axes, right. right? And so what do we know that helps do that? Well, so much research, whether it's in receptive listening or, you know, politicians talk about deep canvassing. There's a lot of research about what happens when you signal to someone that you disagree with, that you actually hear them. What happens when you find that, okay, we have, you like the Yankees, I like the Red Sox, but we're both cancer survivors. When there is some even if there is fierce polarization around some set of issues, there is common experience somewhere else. That, that the leader who seeks to find where is the shared baseline, where is the common experience, where is that fuller humanity, where is the complexity that, oh, I hate what you think about this, but I completely agree with you about this other thing. Yeah. So now you're allowing people to be complicated and be multidimensional instead of the two-dimensional villains that we, you know, the cartoon versions that we create of one another. There is enormous amounts of evidence that if we can get past our misperceptions, get past our attribution of bad motives to the other side, that then we have a chance of moving forward together. And so I think one of the most important things for, again, any leader, but certainly for a moral leader, is to be acutely conscious of contempt that contempt is the most toxic ingredient in discourse. We all are tempted by it. If, you know, here's the little test I run with my students all the time is to think back just over the last 24 hours, if they have described contemptuously someone, some group, some people who are on the other side of the political divide than they are. And if they have, then they are part of the problem. And that has become genuinely difficult in all kinds of arenas where we'll say, okay, I can forgive anyone, anything, but those people. <laughs> and the minute that the words, those people come out of your mouth, you're, right. you're already way down. Yeah. Way down. And, what, and what's hard is with social media, I mean, contempt, outrage pays. It's been monetized. So the incentive to be contemptuous, uh, is, is there. Yeah, I mean, t you know, Twitter, Twitter is, a, is a perfectly designed contempt machine. Right. In addition to being the first uh, female leader of, of time, you were also the person who wrote the most stories, cover stories of time. If you were writing a cover story today, what story needs to be written about what we're living through that is not being told? Wow, 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 what a great question. It is so natural, especially when you have uh, a president who has a genius for attention, that we can't take our eyes off the leader. And right now it is just so, so, so important that we are telling the stories of the lived experience of this emergency, this set of emergencies. That is really hard to do, but the minute that you start to walk in other people's shoes of what is it really like to, so here's, you know, my daughter and I were talking about this, where here we all have been like 
dealing in all of our different ways with the pandemic and the choices and what do we do and go back to school or not. And then this big storm hits the East Coast and the power goes out. So now we're in the dark, there's no internet, there's no air conditioning, the food's rotting in the refrigerator, all of, and it's like one more thing, really? And then, and as we're thinking about this, we're thinking for how many families, the one more thing, it's not the lights going out, yeah. it, it's the job going away. It's all of their belongings piled up on the street outside their home. It's the family member lost to this disease. And the, the kind of incredible hardship that people are experiencing in all different dimensions. I mean, the health certainly, the life and death certainly, but the economic hardship, the, the loneliness, the mental health toll of, for people who don't have social supports, we have to be focusing on that. We have to be exploring and explaining that, that, that this is real and enormous. And that really is what worries me because we're not gonna be able to figure out how do we get out of here? And I'm not sanguine that, uh, that there's a magic bullet, that there's a vaccine, that there's a therapeutic, that there is a, there, you know, we are so like shortcuts. We're just, you know, we're Americans. We, we can get there first and fastest. We can climb the highest mountains and put a man on the moon. You know, we, we love the idea of our ability that has served us very well as a young country, relatively speaking, to solve problems. Uh, I'm not sure that we have the leadership or the muscles or the social trust or any of the ingredients that we need to get out of here without some really painful soul searching work. And you can mm -hmm. say that work is overdue. It is a long time coming that the social injustices that we are confronting now, the racial injustice that we are confronting now is not something that started in May of 2020 mm -hmm. or February of 2020. So this reckoning, with not just the immediate crisis, but the underlying crises, the exposure, what we have discovered about our social fabric, about our systems, about our institutions, and about ourselves. Uh, this has been a moral autopsy of the kind that no one would ever yeah. wish for. Something we have discovered, something precious yeah. has died. And I think what has died is an illusion about our health and an illusion about the health of our society and our institutions. I think if you had asked any of us a year ago or five years ago, what would happen if a global pandemic struck? Would anyone have imagined the kind of division, delusion, deception, dispiriting behavior that we've seen? And that's hard and it's painful and we would all much rather it not be true. Right. And this goes, you know, moral leadership, this goes back to truth, is the first thing is going to be confronting the truth of what we have discovered. Yeah. And, and then looking for and lifting up the people who are, are showing us the way out and the hard work, willing to do the hard work of finding our way out. What, what, a, what a phrase, a, a moral autopsy. And if we're, and it resonates, if we're living in a more, uh, through a moral autopsy, then there's going to be a moral accounting. Who did what? Who didn't? My one source of optimism, since all of us are ingesting so much grim news every day, my one source of optimism is that this has revealed things that were, were true and hidden, and not yeah. hidden from everyone but hidden from large numbers of taste makers and public leaders and, and yeah. cultural icons and thought leaders that the, um, we are, the reckoning was long overdue and the path yeah. we were on um, was not a healthy one in many, yeah. many, many aspects. And so, yes, I think that there was no way there was gonna be a course no. correct. There's such a need right now to be on, to make decisions, to navigate, to forge ahead. One of the capacities and qualities that moral leaders possess is in the midst of all that, in stride to pause. 
because when you pause, you can uh, feel more deeply, think more highly, uh, you can reflect on the situation or the world, you can confront what's been revealed, you can reimagine a better path. How in the middle of all this have you found some, have you paused? This is a pause that none of us chose. Right. We were all told to lock down. Simultaneously on one day to go home and stop doing whatever we were doing or do it totally differently. Uh, but certainly stop doing a lot of things that, you know, you're going to stop going to restaurants, stop going to movie theaters, stop getting on airplanes, stop going into the office, stop, stop going to school. This is a forced pause. Like, you know, when you have to, you know, reboot your computer and wait and wait and wait for it to start up again. And so that was a, a challenge of discovery to all of us, right? right? Because all of a sudden, for instance, it was, it was a, a, a revelation about motivation. It used to be that any of us could say, well, I don't have time to exercise. Or I haven't put the photos in the photo album for the last three years because I just, if only I had time to get around to it, but I'm so busy. Or whatever your thing is. All of us are having to have a version of that reckoning with our own excuses that we don't have, have anymore. And I think that has been a healthy, sobering, humbling mm -hmm. uh, exercise through all of this for a, for a great many people. I mean, the exception to it are people who've still had to go to work because they're essential workers and have had none of the same kind of, right. of cushioning uh, that has protected people like you and me who can sit on our computer and talk to each other. Right. But but for me, having to confront the fact that it turns out I'm not nearly as motivated as I need to be to do things that I think I really want to do. And mm. I'm going to have to do a hard assessment of how much does this mm. matter to me and what am I willing to put into it? And where's, how do I build that muscle? Yeah. I didn't know I needed it. I just thought, I don't have time. Nope, it's a muscle. Yeah. And because those of, on the front lines and essential workers and those who've been harmed, uh, have not had the luxury of the pause. Those who do uh, have almost an obligation, if not an opportunity to not squander it, to really reimagine something, to come out of it somehow redesigned. Just, uh, it's almost a privilege to pause to, uh, to be better. I think that's a great way to think about it. You know, and maybe this is one of the things that the pause allows is no. to take this kind of step back and and ask one another and challenge one another okay what 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 are we learning where were we deluded where were we wrong what have we discovered where's the opportunity that we didn't see what is it that we really care about that we underappreciated and and so i thank you for this for this chance and and i'm grateful for the chance to have the time to have these conversations with my families with my friends with my students that's yeah. that's a that itself is an enormous privilege, so thank you for it. It's a privilege to hear from you uh, and be inspired by your insights, but also by your example of your own moral leadership. Nancy Gibbs, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs>